heavy, heavy, heavy board. this out here we'll see if you guys like this or not but i came across this very interesting article uh last week it was published on april 22nd on substack and i believe it's on the elysian it's called for the substack uh and the article is by l griffin and it's called no one buys books everything we learned about the publishing industry from penguin versus doj so some of you might be familiar with this, uh, the merger between Penguin Random House and Simon & Schuster uh, that got shut down by the DOJ here at the Department of Justice. It was in an antitrust suit. So because of that suit, uh, we got a lot of numbers from the publishing industry. And again, these numbers, as I've said, and many of you listening already know, are kept very close to, you know, very close under lock and key. Like they're not public. And it's fitting that this article is called No One Buys Books because it clearly no one is buying books. Now, there's some caveats to that, but I wanted to go through this here and just see what you guys think. I'm going to give my thoughts on it. There's a lot of interesting information on it. I'm going to link it down below for this kind of heavy bonus segment, but I'd like to know what you guys think because there's a lot of information in here that's very interesting to book lovers and literature lovers and writers. It's really kind of... Um, eye-opening in that regard so let's just kind of start it off and we'll see what we do see how we go here <clears throat> so it starts here and again thanks to l griffin for writing this and putting it together and putting it out there it's a very interesting article again it'll be linked below in 2022 penguin random house wanted to buy simon and schuster the two publishing houses made up 37 percent and 11 percent of the market share according to the filing, and combined, they would have condensed the big five publishing houses into the big four. But the government intervened and brought an antitrust case against Penguin to determine whether that would create a monopoly. The judge ultimately ruled that the merger would create a monopoly and blocked the $2.2 billion purchase. But during the trial, the head of every major publishing house and literary agency got up on the stand to speak about the publishing industry and give numbers, giving us an eye-opening account of the industry from the inside. All the transcripts from the trial were compiled into a book called The Trial. It took me a year to read, but I finally summarized my findings and pulled out all the compelling highlights. And this is interesting. Yeah, I think I can I think I can sum up what I've learned like this. The big five publishing houses spend most of their money on book advances for big celebrities like Britney Spears and franchise authors like James Patterson. And this is the bulk of their business. They also sell a lot of Bibles, repeat bestsellers like Lord of the Rings and children's books like The Very Hungry Caterpillar. These two market categories, celebrity books and repeat bestsellers from the backlist, make up the entirety of the publishing industry, and even fund their vanity project, publishing all the rest of the books we think about when we think about book publishing, which make no money at all and typically sell less than a thousand copies. But let's dig into everything they said in detail. Okay, so this is really good, right? Uh, we kind of already knew this. If you follow the publishing industry, you follow the you kind of literature world, you kind of already knew this, but... Uh, yeah, this is basically the case, right? It is dire out there. They spend it mostly on advances. That's where the biggest expense is, and that makes sense to some extent, right? Like, you know, that's the business they're in, is paying people to write books for them that they can sell, you know, selling rights to books and stories that they can then market and sell. That makes sense. Uh, but, I mean, I've been saying this for a while here, and everybody, you know, people that think that I'm crazy, people that think that I'm just jealous or bitter, there's a huge problem in the industry right now with a total lack of taste and judgment. Like, and I mean total lack to a surprising point. I'm not saying people are stupid in this industry. I'm not saying, oh, they don't know what they're doing. I'm saying that there is a total lack of taste 
and judgment, meaning no one seems to know what the market actually wants. They're just guessing. And this is an entire industry based on guessing. Uh, And again, there's some good points that are made right here. So bestsellers are rare. In my essay, Writing Books Isn't a Good Idea, I wrote that in 2020, only 268 titles sold more than 100,000 copies. And 96% of books sold less than 1,000 copies. That's still the vibe. Of course, again, if you follow this, you follow this podcast, you follow the literature and the publishing industry, you already know this. This has been kind of like, mm, you know, a big deal for the last mm, 10, 15 years. Like, it really has been a kind of over a decade long process of the publishing industry. I don't want to say imploding, but just kind of losing relevance. And, like, they're in a, it's a culture industry. The publishing industry is a culture producing industry and they're not producing culture anymore. I keep making this point. Some people call me crazy for it, whatever. They are chasing culture now. They're not producing it. They're not making it. They are chasing the culture that has already been produced. And I think this has a lot to do with social media and all of that. I think it has a lot to do with, again, this lack of judgment and taste. So nobody is confident in their own taste in a book any longer. They're just confident in whatever the algorithms on TikTok and so forth tell them to be confident in. So that's an issue, right? And we're going to see more of this as I get into this article. But again, it's very interesting here. But then they'll sip a coffee. So this is an exchange with Madeline, Mac- Madeline McIntosh who was CEO of Penguin Random House US. Uh, Question, do you know approximately how many authors there are across the industry with 500,000 units or more during this four-year period? She says, my understanding is that it was about 50. Question, 50 authors across the publishing industry who during this four-year period sold more than 500,000 units in a single year? Yes, that's what Madeline McIntosh says. The DOJ's lawyer collected data on 58,000 titles published in a year and discovered that 90% of them sold fewer than 2,000 copies and 50% sold less than a dozen copies. And this is one of those things where I'm just thinking like, why am I afraid of self-publishing? Like I have friends and they're going to come back on the podcast here. They've been on before that have these deals that have published with these large presses, Harper perennial and stuff. And they've told me some of these numbers that like, it is dire. Like you're, it is so dire out there. And if you're saying 50% of the 58,000 titles published in a year sold less than a dozen copies, like it just, it blows my mind. So if I self-publish, and I sell more than 12 copies in a year. That means I'm on par as if with having a, a book deal with the big five as a debut author. And this is why I've been considering or reconsidering going into self-publishing. And I'm still working on that. I'll keep you guys posted. But I'm just like, Jesus Christ. Also, interesting enough, I just I launched a Substack finally. And right now I'm in the process of putting my backlog on there. So I'm putting things that I've published over the years on there first. Um, But, you know, go ahead and sign up for that if you're interested. The free and paid subscriptions, Substack. I'm just going to try and use it as like a website for me to just kind of post, you know, essays. And mostly I have a lot of movie reviews that I want to post up there and and things like that. But anyway, it's just a side note that I forgot to mention. 50% sold less than a dozen copies. Again, so if I sell more than 12, you know, I'm right up there with the people getting the book deals. I guess the downside is is I didn't get the advance, which would be, you know, 2,500 to 10 grand for a first time author at some of these presses. So let's keep that in mind too, you know, so I am making less money by by self-publishing than I would by self-publishing and selling 12 copies than I would if I got a deal with the gave me, you know, money up front with an advance. So that's something to consider listeners. And there's nothing to scoff at, you know, everybody's, oh, that's no money. I mean, shit, I'm not going to scoff at 2,500 to 10 grand if I'm going to get that for something I wrote. I mean, nothing to scoff at. Uh, All right, let's keep going. In my essay, No One Will Read Your Book, I said that publishing houses work more like venture capitalists. They invest small sums in lots of books in hopes that one of them breaks out and becomes a unicorn, making enough money to fund all the rest. Turns out, they agree. <laughs> All right, Marcus Dole, 
CEO of Penguin Random House says this. This is a quote in the article. Every year, in thousands of ideas and dreams, only a few make it to the top. So I call it the Silicon Valley of media. We are angel investors of our authors and their dreams, their stories. That's how I call my editors and publishers, angels. It's rather this idea of Silicon Valley. You see, 35% are profitable, 50 on a contribute on a contribute 50 on a contribution basis. So every book has that same likelihood of succeeding, of succeeding. Again, it's interesting that this is a CEO of a company whose job it is to sell books. Again, like he's viewing this company that has been profitable for over 100 years as if it's a Silicon Valley venture capitalist thing. Uh, again, I ask who's in charge of these, and apparently it's people like Marcus Dole, who think that uh, he's in the venture capitalist business in Silicon Valley, and not again the cultural creation business. Like it's it's really remarkable that these people what kind of business they think it is. And I've said this point all the time. I tweeted about this, like this entire industry, the the business is selling books. So people like a CEO of Penguin Random House, Marcus Dull. His job is to sell books. And right now, they are not selling books. So I'm just asking myself, okay, like who's in charge of this company? Like, is there a board or something that is going to be like, so why aren't we selling books in the business of selling books? But oh, well, it's tough out there. I'm just thinking to myself, like, what? Like, 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 Jesus, who's in charge of this? Who is trying to create culture that people want, trying to create trends instead of chasing them on TikTok and things, but apparently no one in charge. Uh, so those unicorns happen every five to 10 years or so. All right, here's another quote. Michael Peach, I think is the name, the CEO of Hatchet. We're very hit driven, he says. When a book is successful, it can be wildly successful. There are books that sell millions and millions of copies. And those are financial gushes for the publishers of that book, sometimes for years to come. A gusher is once in a decade or something. For instance, I don't know if you know the Twilight series of books, which we covered on this podcast. Hatchet published the Twilight series of books, and those made hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of time. Right now, the novels of Colleen Hoover are topping the bestseller lists in really, really huge numbers, and the publishers of those books are making a lot of money. You probably remember The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo or the Fifty Shades of Grey series. So once every five years, ten years, those come along for the whole industry and become the industry driver that's drawing people into bookstores because there is such a commotion about them. Again, it's just incredible to me that like in the business of selling books, they're just depending on unicorns. Like, <clears throat> shouldn't they be depending on taste and judgment? Like, that's my whole thing. <clears throat> Where I just say like, Okay, like, like, you're betting, you're gambling, essentially. Like, how do you run a business when you're gambling, like, on, on, on a winner or not? Like, if you know the market so well, why are there no, why isn't everything a bestseller? And it's just kind of, I don't know, it doesn't make sense to me how these, like, who's in charge of this? Apparently, who's in charge is this guy like Michael Peach, who's uh, running Hatchet. And just as kind of shrugging his shoulders like every other CEO that's quoted in this as we keep going. You'll see. Uh, this one is one that doesn't really matter. The next section here where it says big advances go to celebrities. They spent a lot of the trial talking about books that made an advance of more than 250000 They called these anticipated top sellers. According to Nicholas Hill, a partner at Bates White Economic Consulting, 2% of all titles earn an advance over 250000 Again, if you follow the industry, you follow things like this podcast, you already know this. That's a rare amount of money to get for an advance. That's like Stephen King level. Publisher's Marketplace says it's even lower. <laughs> so here we have Ken White, a publisher at Southern, uh, Sutherland House says, top-selling authors were defined as those receiving advances, i.e. guaranteed money, in excess of 250000 Far fewer than 1% of authors receive advances over that mark. Publishers Marketplace, which tracks these things, recorded 233 such deals in all of 2022. It's kind of crazy that, I mean, you know, 233, it seems like a lot. I mean, I mean, all the book deals that are going out, like 233 seems like a lot of people getting 250000 for what it is. Maybe that's it. Like, they keep saying, oh, they know the market, they know the market, but they keep flooding it with garbage. 
stuff nobody wants to read or buy or cares about. And, well, look where the industry is now. As I said, I mean, there's a total lack of judgment and taste. You need to judge a work of art, and you need to trust your taste on it. Uh, these people do neither. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full-length episodes jerk shop heavy bonus content subscribers only ama episodes bonus extended interviews and more come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board